And I'm going to dive straight in, unfortunately, with a, a little bit of a nasty one, because okay. I'm a nice person like that. Um, the EBA database, let's talk about PSD2 open banking. The EBA database has a disclaimer on the front of it. It doesn't cover credit institutions. Um, what's the purpose of the EBA database? Because some ASPs, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff out there saying you only need to check the IDAS certificate. Other people are saying you only need to check the EBA database. Other people are saying you need to check source data. What is the position? What's the, what was the purpose of the EBA database? And what's, it, what's the role? Well, the EBA database is, first of all, it's a mandate that we have from the legislation, from PSD2, you know, that we have to create the database. It's a database that what it does, it provides information, as you said, it provides information on payments, inst payments institutions, not uh, all of them, because the banks, the credit institutions, will have a different, re different registry for banks, which is also on the EBA. Uh, second, uh, what I think is important is we aggregate the information. The ones that are responsible for collecting the information and keeping the information updated and up-to-date are the national competent authorities of the 28 countries of the Union. So that's why the disclaimer comes from. The disclaimer comes mainly from that part and from the fact that, you know, what, the, what we do, we have a relatively what I consider effective system, is that they report to us and we publish it all aggregated at the EBA the base. Most, as of today, most national company authorities report it automatically, but not all of them. Some of them report it manually with a frequency that for the manual ones is daily, but in that sense it's not really an on-time database. And it's also, I think it's important to, to clarify, it's not a commercial service. We don't offer this on a commercial basis. You know, it's to fulfill a mandate on transparency, which I think was important for the legislators. So it's not a commercial offering, really? No, it's not a commercial offering. It's an information provider. And as I say, we are not even just aggregating the information. The real reliable information is in the, at the NCAs. So just repeat back what you said, that the really reliable information is at the source NCAs. And is that what banks should be, ASPSP should be relying on, the source data? Well, I think that it, in general, yes, because that's the legal requirement. They are the ones that have the updated there. As I say, you know, we think we have a system that's very efficient in the sense that all of them, not all of them, all of them report to us, but not all of them automatically. Yeah. You know, and it, to the extent that they're, they're Database is accurate, then our database will be accurate if it's reported automatically, but the responsibility for being accurate relies on them. And as I said again, for a number of them, as of today, it's still reported manually on a daily basis, so it's not on real time. So the, if they really want to, if they want to be sure reputationally, because banks have a reputation issue as well as a, I mean, maybe you could talk about, the, the, there's regulation, there's reputation, isn't there? And that, I think that's an important aspect. You know, I mean, regulation is, by definition, things that people are expected to comply with, and they're required to comply with to operate in business. If not, they're subject, obviously, to fines of different kinds or, or even more important regulatory actions. Uh, reputation is an issue that you know, has to be managed by organizations as they, as they engage in business with their customers and with their stakeholders. You know? Of course, part of that reputation, a very important chart, is fulfilling regulatory requirements, you know, because it's a mass to be in business, but not the only part of the reputation aspect. So the fact that people say we only need to check EIDAS certificates, that's just, the reg that's just the regulation bit, not the reputation and the risk management piece. Is that fair? Well, that, that's fair to say, but let's, let's, keep, let's keep a track on this, okay? The PSD2, a big component, component of what it was to, was trying to provide adequate access, security, and faster innovation. Yep. And those are three basic principles that are allowed the PSP. At the time when PSP was, was but forward, it was important to make sure that there was adequate access so that the third party providers could have adequate access and some of these mechanisms are built to enhance that adequate access. You know? But that's not the only mechanism that's in place. There are other mechanisms that need to be worked as well, which is security, you know, and adequate customer relationships. You know? So the two things that you're pointing to, the IDAS and the, and the database, are to provide information to facilitate access. But it's not the only pieces of regulatory compliance to start with, and it's not the only pieces in which business should be engaged with, as I said, you know, their reputations and their aspects that are very important for them. Okay, and you raise an interesting point there about security, risk. You know, fraudsters are good business people, aren't they? <laughs> well, uh, they're very good at their business, unfortunately, for many of us, you know, and I think that's something that we need to be concerned about, and it's not just on the payments world, you know, but broadly speaking, as EBA, you know, we've been very much engaged and very much concerned about the interaction between technology, you know, changes in the landscape of, of, of players, 
the if I were if 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 I may say you know the the difficulty of identifying boundaries both cross border clearly cross sectoral as well sometimes even within the value added chains the value added chains are breaking so you know it's like outsourcing and as a result of that for us broadly speaking there are three fundamental concerns which is operational resilience of the system crime prevention and financial stability you know and those are three aspects in which we want to make sure that 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 as we move towards a new frame, new landscape, or new framework for innovation, for activities, for performance services to clients, those three things are preserved. I'd like to move a little bit on because um, PSD2 Open Banking officially kicked off September the 14th last year. Except for the FCA in the UK said, oh, we're not going to enforce it for six months. The Danish regulator said, no, you've got to start it straight away. And we haven't really heard a lot from the rest of the NCAs around Europe. It seems to me that no one's really enforcing PSD to open banking. And I'm going to say as an environment, a lot of people are saying, well, do you know what? It's coming, but you know, who's enforcing it? No one's going to be checking on us. Well, I think that's absolutely wrong, if I may say so. You know, I think that uh, what's absolutely right, and you were right, is in two things. One is in that the regulation came into effect September 14th. So from the legal point of view, there's absolutely no doubt. You know, the regulations in place and entities need to be compliant with, compliant with. It's also true that in particular aspects of the implementation of PSD2, you know, one is the one that you're referring to, another one is, for instance, SCA, yeah. you know, in which given the sort of granularity of the implementation of this across the board and the challenge that were put forward, we're still going through a little bit of a transition period in which national competent authorities, as they are sort of trying to make sure that we, know, we preserve something that's very important with the PSD2, which is the trust by customers in the ability of the existing technology and the existing regulation to provide payment services that are reliable, secure, massively so they could use it. Because the alternative is to generate the perception that they're not secure, they're not reliable, or they're not cost effective, and we end up having no official payment services. So in that process, it is true that Super, national company authorities, and we've been looking at them, and we've been working with them to make sure that they look very clear for the transition plans, you know, that they, they balance this possibility that, 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 you know, some people, some providers in SCA, some particular industries or merchants may have difficulties in implementing 100%, but those transition plans have to be in effect, have to be effective, you know, on the third-party providers. Uh, our, my expectation is by the end of the first quarter, all these transitions should be finished. In the SCA, we issue an opinion saying you know, that transition plans should not go beyond the end of this year. You know? But of course, you know, our expectation is that national authorities will look into this carefully, will enforce it, and we will be checking that they do it. So, just to repeat back to be clear, your expectation is at the end of this quarter, local NCAs, should be starting to enforce PST to open banking. And are you checking that yourself on what the NCAs are doing? We will be working with this and we'll identify gaps. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll check with them. We have ultimately, you know, we have, we have powers, we have tools, we have mechanisms to ensure enforcement. You know, at, at the end of the, as I say, the enforcement, first of all, of course, is on the obligated entities whoever is the payment service or the third party provider, whoever it is. You know, after the obligated entities, the NCAs have the ob obligation to make sure that the obligated entities comply and if they follow actions to make sure that they comply on remediation plans. And we have the mandate to make sure to work with the NCAs that compliance is effective. The way that compliance is effective and across the 28 markets of the European Union. So, so by quarter two, you would expect NCAs to start to be active in actually making sure that we're moving ahead with PSD2 Open Banking? Uh, I would say I, I expect them to be already active on oh. that, you know, on making sure that we're moving ahead. Now, I expect that I understand that some of them have indicated that they're following very closely the transition plans of those entities that are still not able to comply, and those transition plans will be done by March, so that by March, you know, everybody should be able to comply, and if they're not compliant, I would say the honeymoon is over. The honeymoon, honeymoon period is over. Is over yes. The honeymoon period is over at the end of March. Okay, that's a very clear statement. On, the, on that part. Yes, because on that as, part. As I said, on SCA, we indicated because the technology challenges there are different, the capillarity of all, of all you know, sectors of the economy, we indicated that the transition will, expect it will continue until the year end. Okay, I think that's, you couldn't be clearer on that. Uh, I think that was really Thank useful um, to get such a clear statement on that. Um, 
In, in terms of hindsight, though, I'm going to ask you a little cheeky question here. You published the regulatory technical standards. They weren't technical, and they weren't a standard. Um, should they have been more of a technical standard? Uh, I, I, I appreciate your play on words. If I'm honest, from my perspective, they were quite technical. You know, I read them, I'm not sure I understand them. And you know, the issue about whether they were standard or not, I think this, this Well, we have nine standards in Europe now. But that's fine. I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, if I were to pick a, if I were to have to pick a standard as a regulator, I would be totally killed, probably because more likely than not, I have picked the wrong standard. <laughs> You know, so the question is, it's not the role of the regulators to pick standards, unless in those cases in which there are issues, as I said before, that are fundamental of financial stability, you know, or lack of competition, or some kind of safety. So, could, so should it be incorporated? There are many, there are, let me just, let me just finish. there are many instances in regulated entities in which we have different standards cooperating, and this part of the market dynamics. And I actually take it to be positive, the fact that we did not set a standard, or just say it's not a standard. We did set minimum requirements that the standards should, the standards should work with, you know. And we have interacted with some of these operators, and we see that there are some major, I say, there's a number of them operating right now, and I'm happy that that happens. And that's a desire, you know, when we talk about regulatory, we always talk about sort of desirable outcomes and non-desirable outcomes. In this part, I will put it in, in the category of desirable outcomes. So, multiple operating standards in Europe is a desirable outcome of the market interpreting the guidance. As, as long, exactly, because the guidance are not uh, prescriptive on a unique standard. You know, they require certain standards or certain requirements, if I may say, you know, but certain requirements that any standard should comply with. Okay, I think that's really helpful. Uh, um, okay. Um, and in terms of, you know, many people have said PSD2 open banking hasn't really taken off yet. It's, it's growing, but it's not really. Who do you see as the um, role of actually promoting and explaining to the end users what open banking is. I mean, is it the regulators? Is it the end fintech providers? Is it the banks? You know, because one of the people said to me is that at least when we launched contactless cars, the schemes put a lot of money into explaining it. Now it's a very fragmented value chain, and therefore there's no one to really drive the explanation other than the EBA, who's ultimately created it. Well, I think that it's important. You ask me who should set open banking. I also have the same question. I should ask you that question. What is open banking? What is open banking? The ability to access data. What data? Customers' data. Which data? Sorry? Which data? I mean, I think that the PSD2 has helped us and has clarified what open banking means in the area of payments, which is that you know, we have the ability to access transaction data. Okay, that's fine. That's what we are responsible for. That's what we've done. In that part, I think that open banking has progressed and now it's the time to implement it. Now, if we're thinking about accessing other types of data, then the regulatory framework is not there. Right. You know? And I know there's national, at least at the European Union level, there are national authorities that have been working on maybe providing more access to other types of data. And here I can go as far as you want. You know, I can talk about demographic data from the, through the financial industry. The financial industry has demographic data, has transaction data, has investor data, has risk profiling data has many other kinds of information, you know. So far, the regulation at the European level has gone to transaction data for payments, you know. And that's the part in which PSD2 has progress, where we have responsibilities. That's the part, I think, in which we've made some progress, I hope, you know, and we, the industry has gone, as other areas maybe become part of the discussion towards this idea of open banking. Then uh, other regulatory frameworks may come forward. It could be other authorities that may be engaged in this process, you know, and that they benefit from our experience as we go through the transaction data provision, that will be helpful. But at the end, you know, as I say, you know, when we talk about open banking, I think that part of the challenge that we have is that it's not clarity on what is it exactly that people mean when they think about open banking. You know? So far, from the regulatory point of view in Europe, it's transaction data. So, so looking ahead a couple of years, um, which isn't that far away, you know, not forget five, ten years away, just a couple of years. What would your vision be, or what do you believe we'll be seeing out in the marketplace around PSD to open banking, and in particular payments, because this is the payment stream. So how would you see PSD to open banking affecting payments in a, over the next couple of years? 
Well, a couple of years in regular framework is a short frame. It's a short time frame. In innovation, I understand it's a large. It's a very long time frame. But basically, you know, for me, the key component will be PSD2 is in application. You know, this first part of our conversation about making sure that people have clarity on how to comply, where to comply, what the requirements are. You know, that should be out of the picture. Yeah. We should have absolutely no doubt on what PSD2 means. It doesn't mean in terms of compliance. As we go through that process, I'm hoping that three other things get accomplished at the same time. That we maintain the level of trust and usefulness that people have on how well our payment systems work. That's priority number one, because if we don't get that one, we will not get a payments industry. Second one is that we maintain an environment in which we can be comfortable, you know, that there's competitive dynamics that are constructive so as to make sure that they provide adequate services to the customers. Whatever the technology, whoever the player is, you know, adequate service to the, the customer at a much better terms as we go ahead. You know, that's the second aspect. The third aspect is that as we go through this process and we develop technologies, we develop new ways of interacting, we develop new players, you know, we're not, you know, hampering on the three aspects that I mentioned before, which is operational resilience, the operational resilience stays, you know, that we have safety in the system and that we're avoiding loopholes that foster financial crime, particularly, you know, AML, other aspects of crime. And with that, I'm very conscious of your time. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. Um, and his business card, as I said, is on the front here if you need to take a picture. Otherwise, I'm going to let you run to your call because I know it is a very important call. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.